with flesh on he walked with us he talked with us he ate with us we followed him and we learned from him and we were amazed and mesmerized by him we were challenged by him and we were we were we, were, we, were, we learned from him when, when, when the very beginning began he was already there he had existed before it all before time he wasn't just in the beginning he was before the beginning began he's the beginning of the beginning he was there before the beginning, before there was anything. It's interesting to note that both in the Jewish culture and in the Greek culture, John is writing into, trying to help them understand who Jesus was. He starts by calling him the word, which is literally, because uh, both Greek and Jews, cult, Jewish culture taught that it was God's word, the logos that spoke spoke and set the world into motion. It created everything. And it was the word, the, the logos that kept it going in perfect order. So John is trying to help people in his first century understand who Jesus was. He begins by saying, listen, for centuries you have been talking about and thinking about and teaching about all of this started. And you, and you understand the words of God spoke it all. The logos of God started it all and kept it, kept it all in order. I want you to understand who he is, what his name is. His name is Jesus and God created everything. He goes on to say in verse three, God created everything through him. Nothing that has been created wasn't created through him. It was created through him. So, so maybe you would think that now when he came, when he showed up, his life might have been a stick in the mud kind of life. If God showed up in the flesh and walked among us, would you feel like you were on pins and needles? Would it be like no fun? Would it be like that religious experience you had at church where you couldn't even talk and act like yourself because you had to follow the rules? Or would it be something different? Would it be better than that experience? Would it be life-giving? Would it be healthy? Would it be fun? Would it be full of love? This is what John says when he showed up. His word, the word gave life not only to everything that was created, but when he lived and walked among us, it brought light to everyone. His life was so amazing. In him was something that nobody else possessed. It was like the light of life and it shined in the darkness and nothing could put that light out. Nothing could extinguish that. No, no darkness, no problem, no challenge, no moment. And it was almost as if in these first few verses, John is sitting down and he's trying to articulate for us and you can hear his heart behind his words. Jesus was so much more than a man. He was so much more than anything you could ever imagine. Being with him was amazing. Being with him was like light in a dark room. Being with him was like life full of deadness around you. It was like something came alive inside of all of us. It was incredible. It was enjoyable. It was life-giving. It was life-changing. It was something to celebrate. The Word walked among us. God put on human flesh and walked among us, and there wasn't anything more incredible and greater than that. So, so immediately as John is writing, those words fly off the pages of the scriptures and they confront you and they confront me and they challenge us with what we think about this Jesus and what we have experienced about this Jesus in our lives. Is it good like that or is it different than that? Is there maybe more to Jesus than your bad experience with a church or with a Christian? Is there more to this season of Advent than enduring it and getting through it? Maybe there's something he can do in us through it all. Maybe he's better than our experiences. Maybe he's someone to enjoy instead of just endure. When John starts in these first five verses, he it forces us to ask the question, what does it really mean for God to take on human flesh and walk among us? Well, the, fir the, the first thing I think we have to wrestle with is that we have to understand that John is saying the very God of heaven, the God who made heaven and earth, who spoke it into existence, who existed before the beginning of the beginning, chose to become like us and humble himself and walk among us. And he did it for a purpose. What was the purpose? What was the reason? Simple. If he could, 
If he was going to help us, he had to be with us. He had to understand us and see it from our point of view. When Jesus came, John says he wasn't 50% God and he wasn't 50% man. He didn't have some sort of watered down mixture of both. No, he says he was full of both. He was fully human and yet fully God all at the same time. Why is that important? It's important for a lot of reasons, but one in particular stands out among them. Because as God, Jesus can help us. And as a human, he can relate to us. And we needed both. We didn't need a God who would love us from a distance and not know us or understand us. We needed a God who would love us and show up in person and bring all his power and all his authority and all his help to see it from our perspective and feel it through our emotions and live it and experience it through our set of eyes, from our point of view. A God who knows and a God who can help. This is always God's plan. It was, it was the only way to truly help us and to save us. See, see, you don't have a God who is content to love you from a distance. That's easy. You have a God who shows up and loves you up close and personal. No matter the mess, no matter how difficult, no matter what you've done, in the middle of your hopelessness, in the middle of your helplessness, in the middle of your problem, he's not the God who loves you from a distance. He's the God who shows up and knocks on the door and wants to hang out with you in your living room. He loves you. In the middle of it all, he brings his care and his hope and his help up close and personal, right where you need it, right when you need it most. And that's the good news wrapped up in the arrival of Jesus. God became like us and he walked among us. And you want to know why? The motivation for why he came, the motivation for the incarnation was you. You matter to him. You're important to him. God loves you. And he has a plan to help your life, bring hope to your life and change to your life because you matter to him. People always want to know, do they matter? Do they matter to us? Do they matter to God? Well, Jesus showing up, I want you to see the the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus from a whole new perspective. Him taking on flesh overwhelmingly answers the question, do I matter to God? Absolutely. In fact, you matter so much to him that if you were the only person, he would have put on flesh just for you and you alone. He came for you so he could walk among us and and, and save us. Jesus was so much better than what people could have ever imagined. When God walked among us in the flesh, he wasn't anything like people thought he would be like. He wasn't known by his rules and his his regulations. He He didn't walk around making people feel horrible about themselves because imperfect people hung out with a perfect God. You would naturally feel uncomfortable and some tension. Like, I don't fit. Like, I gotta act right because I'm going to hang out with God today. But but people who are nothing like him loved being with him. He was so much better. His reputation, he was known by love, even by people who didn't agree with him and who didn't believe in him and didn't like him. Religious people usually don't make our lives better, right? Religious people usually don't make us feel better about ourselves or about our past or about our future. Come on, you've met a religious person. They usually make us feel worse about ourselves. But but not Jesus. People who were nothing like him loved being with him. And they enjoyed every moment and they celebrated every moment that they had with him because the way he made them feel when he was with them was incredible. That's why people who knew him loved him because they knew that he didn't just say the words, but he lived the life of love. They looked forward to being with him wherever he taught, wherever he would eat, when he would do miracles in their towns, people followed him and they wanted to be with him because he loved people. He made every single person feel like they mattered to God because they did. 
He made every single person feel their value in the eyes of God. He elevated the the value of women and children and foreigners and people who weren't even from the Jewish nation. He he brought everybody to the same level in the eyes of God and in the hope and the love and the mercy he gave them when they were with him. They knew that they had value and that they mattered and they were important and that they were loved. If you think about it, it's the same reason why we love the people we love. It's the same reason why we are looking forward to spending time with whoever it is we're looking forward to spend time with this holiday season is because we enjoy being with them and we look forward to being around them because the way they make us feel when we're with them is good. We enjoy them for that. We love them for that. We always look forward to those people who help our lives feel and be better and feel like we matter. That's how Jesus made every person feel. That's how those who knew him best describe how he was every day. But I realize that maybe it hasn't been your experience. Maybe not a lot of people's experience. And because maybe a bad experience with one of his followers or with the church, you've come to a very different conclusion about who this Jesus is and about this whole season of Advent and celebrating his arrival. And while I'm very, very frustrated every time I hear a bad church experience story and I get... I get motivated to do something different and to live a different life and have a different kind of church. And I'm sad that that's been your experience. I gotta tell you the truth though. That's not who Jesus was and is. That's not how he made people feel. That might have been how they made you feel, but that may not be how he is. And they might be very different from who he really, really is. Because the truth is he loved everyone unconditionally, no matter what. And overwhelmingly, they walked away knowing that they had value and that they mattered to God, even if they didn't agree You just sat around the table with people who you don't agree with. I wonder how that went. Jesus had a reputation of love and his example still challenges and inspires us today. And so if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't know what you believe in, then I hope that some of what we say today helps change your mind about him. And I pray that you might be able to let go of what holds you back and those wounds from the past that keep you from experiencing the truth of who he is and what he wants to do in your life. But, but if you here, are here and you are a follower of Jesus, then I pray that this conversation would motivate you and challenge you to live your life differently, more like his, so that as you prepare to gather again with those people that you love, with your family and your friends, holiday season that the way you treat people, the way you talk to people, the way you love people, would be like a light in a dark world and they would feel the warmth of God's love and the hope of God's love and the value of God and and, and that they matter to God. Because if you follow Jesus, listen, you are to live like he lived and you should influence others like he did. And, And my fear is that perhaps the way people experience us is very different from the way they experienced him. John said people look forward to his arrival. They anticipated it, and they celebrated it. When he put on flesh, Luke's gospel tells us that shepherds and angels and even wise men gathered to celebrate the occasion. This was a momentous occasion, and for anybody who knew him when he grew up, uh, they recognized that his arrival marked the moment that history changed not only in their lives, but in their world. So so naturally, it was an exciting time. And and he grew up and he began to to say things and do things that challenged the status quo. It was a brand new movement of love and and hope. And it changed one life at a time. And people would look forward to being with him everywhere he went. They got so excited and they celebrated him so much whenever he was with them. They didn't want to go home. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, then I, I, I challenge you. Your idea of who Jesus might be might be very wrong because of your experiences with his followers. Don't let that stand in the way of the real thing because people who didn't agree or believe still loved him and followed him. And if you are a follower, then listen, let me ask you this question. Are you known in your world like he was known in his? Are, would those of you... Would those who know you say that you, they enjoy being with you like people enjoy being with him? Do, they, do you make them feel like he made people feel? Do you point them to hope in the future or do you remind them of their past? Would, would they say that they're looking forward to being with you this holiday season? Or would they say you're one of those that they simply endure? 
John, who knew Jesus best, said people enjoyed being with him. They didn't endure Jesus. But if you were to ask that of most people today, when it comes to Christians in their lives, they'd answer very, very differently. But I think Jesus can help us, all of us who say we follow him, have a better reputation and a better life so we can live a life more like his. Because if you follow Jesus, and those of you who don't and who don't agree, you're going to give a hearty amen to this. You'll say, yeah, you're right. Uh, but, But if you follow Jesus, then I really don't care as much about all the things you say that you believe. I don't care as much about all the things you say you have faith in. I want to know how well do you love people. I want to know how you make the people around you feel when they're with you. I want to know whether or not they enjoy being with you like they enjoy being with him because the way we make people feel makes all the difference. Jesus made people feel like they mattered, like they had purpose in every moment and every conversation. He cared for them and he loved them and he valued them. Even when he had to share hard truths with them, even when he, he, he had to share things that were going to help change their life, he did it with love. Even when they didn't accept him or agree with him, even, even when they didn't respond, you know, or change their life in response to what he was saying. He, he still loved them well. He, he had their best interest in mind. Everything he did, he did in a helpful, life-giving way. He never once condemned. He never criticized. He never lectured. He never ostracized. He never judged. When he sat together with anyone, he loved. One day, he'll sit on his throne. He'll judge one day, but when he came in the flesh, he encouraged, he loved, he believed, he forgave, he healed, he touched, he sat, he talked, he ate with, he drank with, he enjoyed them and they enjoyed him. It was like he brought heaven to earth. He was bringing a new kingdom from heaven to earth, a kingdom built around a new motive, love, not religion, not law, not rules, but love that people mattered more than anything else. His purpose was to show people how much God really loved them by actually loving people rather than just talking about loving people. It's a novel idea. He wanted them to feel the love, to to hear it and to experience it, not just not just know about it, because they needed to know how much they mattered to God. This new kingdom had this new ethic of love that started a brand new movement. We call it the church, whose primary mission was to love people in the same way that God has loved us through Jesus Christ. Not to treat people like their sins deserve. Not to make people and remind them of all the things that they've done. Not to condemn or or criticize them into following Jesus or guilt them or shame them or remind them of all the things they've done wrong. But to love them like God actually loves them. Maybe that's a very different reality than your experience. Because the way we make people feel makes all the difference. Jesus knew that. I wonder if we do. Listen, if, if, if people don't matter as much as our preferences, if people don't matter as much as our points of view, if people don't matter to us more than the problems they bring up and create in our lives, we are doing it wrong because people always matter more. But I wonder at your Thanksgiving table, and I wonder at your Christmas celebration, will preferences become more important than people? Or will points of view become more important than people? Or will the problems that people inevitably create, it's one certainty of life, people make problems. But will you love people more than the problem. See, see, Jesus will help us. Jesus lived his life in such a way that no point of view, no preference, no problem, nothing mattered more than people. And for that, I'm grateful. He was motivated by love and everything he said and everything he did, it motivated him to come. It motivated him to go to the cross. It motivated him to empower us with the Holy Spirit to help us be on mission to love people like he loved people. Because people still today need to know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. And if you have family members in your family who don't follow Jesus, I guarantee you your mission field to reach so that they know that they are loved by God and you is right there sitting in your home. I guarantee it. That's exactly who God wants you to love first. Love people the same way he loves you. 
It's what Jesus says, I want most. What does God want most for his followers? Jesus said it. He said, I want you to love each other just like I have loved you because when you do, it will prove to the world regardless of what you say you believe, regardless of all the things you say you have faith in, but that you will really follow me and that you're really my disciple. I was known by love. Christians, Jesus would ask us, are you? I help people see their value. Christians, do you? I never let anything get in the way of how I loved people. Let me ask you, Christians, do you? And nobody's perfect, right? We're not perfect in this. But Jesus loved in such a way that it, it wasn't about him. It was about them. It wasn't about him. It was about us. It was a selfless kind of love that was about you and about me. If it had been about him, then perhaps he would have approached it differently. But because it was about us, he came loving and encouraging and helping people see. So he, so he could help us and he could relate to us. He had to be close with us to do that. He had to feel God's love to trust God. Because what religion will, will do, what rules will do, what bad experiences will do is it will break the trust that you have in a good and loving God. And so maybe you endure this season and maybe you maybe give credence to this, you know, Jesus and, and to Christianity, but you really don't embrace it and you really don't enjoy it. You endure it. And for you, this might be the hardest time because of what has happened in your life. But the love of God isn't meant to be endured. The, the person of Jesus isn't meant to be endured. He's meant to be experienced and enjoyed. It will transform everything. The Apostle Paul's life was transformed by the love of Jesus, and it took him from persecuting Christians to becoming one himself. And listen to what he described God's love and the love of Jesus like. He says, this isn't just the way that Jesus loved. This is the way that I think we all should love. He said, this love that Jesus had for me was patient and it was kind. You know, it wasn't jealous. It wasn't selfish. It wasn't boastful or proud or rude. It didn't demand its own way. It wasn't even irritable. And it didn't keep any record of being wrong. It, it, it doesn't rejoice with, with injustice, but it rejoices with the truth. Love never gave up on me. It never lost faith in me. It always hoped and believed in me. Jesus endured every circumstance in my life and never stopped loving me. And because of all these things, this, you know, what's going to last forever, Paul would go on to say, is, is the faith that he helped me have and the hope of a future with him in heaven and the love that changed everything. And I guess he would say even out of all of these amazing things that will last forever, what will last even and will be even greater is the love of God for us. We read this and we think, wow, sounds amazing. Maybe we should have that read at our wedding, Right? But this was the way that he lived. Jesus lived this way every single day of his life. This is how he made people feel. This was how he was known. This is not how Jason lives every day of his life. This probably isn't how you live every day of your life. He was perfect. Okay, so we'll give him that. But he can help us. He is still remembered by those who didn't agree with him. He is still considered by those who deny the existence of God as still one of the greatest human beings who's ever lived. Even those who don't agree with him still acknowledge that he loved people in a way and his message of love was countercultural even in the ancient world. It's still countercultural today. This is why people who are nothing like him loved being with him. And even if they rejected everything he stood for and said that he believed and wanted, everything he wanted to do, he still loved them. And when they were with him, they felt like they mattered. They weren't a project to fix. They were a person to love. That's why it breaks my heart anytime somebody has a bad experience with a church or a Christian because it's such a far cry from who Jesus really is. We just celebrated Thanksgiving with Betsy's family and some of our family members. And like your family, our family has a lot of nuance and a lot of difference and a lot of opinions and a lot of different points of view and, and politics and religious beliefs. You know what Betsy and I prayed for? Because we realize we're pastors and people are coming to the house of a pastor 
who may not have anything in, uh, that, that they agree with in terms of what we would believe. So what we prayed and what we always pray for is that, Lord, when they're with us, let us love them in such a way that they feel like they matter to us and to you. Let them want to come back. I don't know about you, but there are people who I know who love God who I don't like being around because when I'm with them, I'm a project to fix. I'm a person to convince and persuade to see things from their point of view. I'm not a person to love. And I think, I think God, if I might say this, I think God is fully capable of changing people's hearts and lives if we just would love them better. Maybe the love that we give people would be what God would draw them to in him so that the transformation and the change that only God can do can happen. But I wonder if we play a part in keeping someone we love far from God because they are not a person to love, they are a project to fix. Am I stepping on toes too much yet? Or should I come back a little bit? If we follow Jesus, the expectation is that we will love people like he loves people. Now, if you don't follow Jesus, you get to decide for you. You're still in charge of you. Will you love people like this selflessly? Will you not put preference or points of view or other things and more become more important than people but uh, that's up to you and I hope that you will but but if you do follow Jesus you have to understand and I know that you love him and I know that you mean well but you have to understand something your responsibility your the expectation over your life is that you would simply love people be with them have a reputation known by love and watch what God will do through your conversations Watch what God will do through your relationships. That's your job if you're a follower of Jesus, to love as God has loved you. Love them in the same way. And so if you follow Jesus, the question you and I have to wrestle with is what needs to change in my life so that I can live more like him? Now, we just went through Thanksgiving and maybe you didn't do a very good job of this. Maybe you did. Good job if you did. But you're about to sit back down together with the people you love the most. What needs to change in me? so that when they're with me, when they leave, they know that they're loved. They know that they matter. They want to come back. This is what I I tell my kids. I, I pray that there are two things you know by the time you grow up. One, that you are accountable to God for your life. Not me, but to God. You'll stand before him one day and give an account. And number two, I want you to want to come home because you love being with us, no matter what. So do people feel that from you? And if we honestly ask ourselves that question this season of Advent, then I think that God can help us see things we might be missing. God will help us to change some things that we might be doing that make it difficult for people who want to follow God and who want to believe in Jesus, but we just keep getting in the way of it. All right, that's my, that's my last little soapbox sermon point. How can I love people in my world more like him? That's the question. Will we love Go to that next slide, guys. Will we love more like Jesus? If you are a follower of Jesus, this is what I want you to be wrestling with through this series. Will I choose to love people like Jesus loved me? And in John chapter one, I would encourage you to be reading this chapter and rereading this chapter and just reread this chapter and pray through this because what he writes in this first chapter of John will blow your mind and change your life. But will you choose to love like him? The light, John said, it was like shining in the darkness and nothing could put it out. Because of his love, he's still revered and celebrated. And it draws people, the light does. It draws them out of darkness to God. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe you're watching online and you still don't know what you believe about Jesus, then what John writes, these timeless verses, what John has said, the question remains for you to wrestle with. Was John wrong about Jesus? Or was he right? Was he telling the truth? Will you believe that God actually took on human flesh? Will you believe that the one behind it all, who spoke it all, and who keeps it all into existence in order, that he did come and take on human flesh and live among us through the person of Jesus Christ? And that he did it because he loves you and that you matter to him and he has a plan for your life better than what you could have for your life. It's the same motivation and love that caused him to die on a cross and raise from the dead to give you what you couldn't give yourself. You've got to wrestle with what John said he saw. 
And with what John said he experienced, and with what John said changed his life, this was more than a man. So was he wrong or was he right? You've got to do something with what he said. You've got to wrestle with it and come to a conclusion. And I would pray that you would let nothing get in the way of the truth about who Jesus is and what he can do for you, that he came because he loves you, because you matter to him, and because he has a plan for your life. Even if you struggle with the whole God and human flesh thing, don't you want to believe in a God who's as good as that? Even if you're wrong, and all this is a farce, wouldn't you rather believe in a God who's as good as that and loves people like that? I certainly would. I have a lot of things I could, in fact, my first version of this sermon was filled with about 25 different proofs for why you could believe in Jesus. I chose not to do that to you this morning because I know the chiefs aren't playing. We'd be here all day, right? But I chose not to do that. But I can tell you that John wasn't wrong. And he shares the opinion of many people throughout the scriptures and, and myself and many people in this, in this room. Because you have to ask the question, if he's wrong, then what is what we're about to enter into all for? If, if you don't believe, then all we're doing is entering into a marketing campaign, right? A cultural tradition that people buy into. There's got to be more to it than that. There's got to be more to it than what you've experienced. There's got to be something more and deeper and greater beneath the glitz, the glam, all the presents and all the things. Maybe it really is about a God who entered the world, who loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. And that's the choice that John presents to each of us today. Will we follow him and live like him, bringing this new kingdom into the world still today? Will we believe in him if we struggle? Will we believe that he was fully God and fully man and that when he walked among us, it was something to enjoy. That might blow your complete paradigm of what God is like and what Christianity is like, but I challenge you and I invite you to consider that maybe he's better than your experience. Maybe he's better than that bad experience with a Christian or a church. His arrival was long awaited. It was highly anticipated. It was celebrated and it can still be today because I believe he wants to move in our lives. Let me pray for you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you did not stay distant. Thank you that you came close and you came personally into our lives, into our world, because you love us and we matter to you. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that you're good and loving. Thank you that nothing that we could ever do could make you stop loving us. Thank you that no amount of darkness and no amount of problems and no amount of pain kept you from us how much we matter to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that we would not just approach this Advent season so casually that we would do this year and approach it with such a new reverence, such a new adoration, such a new openness, God, that we would ask you right now, if we're followers of you, that we would ask you right now to fill our lives fresh and new. Help us to love people. Show us the areas in our lives that need to change so we can love people so that they're, when they're with us, they know that we love them and that they matter to us so that they will know that they matter to you. I pray, God, help us be people who love like Jesus loves. And if we don't believe, then my prayer is that they would be willing today, wherever they might be, whatever they might be walking through, to say, I want to believe in a God like that, a God who loves me like that, and who says I matter to him like that. All you need to do is to believe. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, say, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you are the Son of God who loves me and who wants to forgive and save and change me, I give you my life. I surrender control. You are God, and I will follow you. Let this be a Christmas that changes everything for you because you have faith in him, in the real Jesus. You're so much greater, so much better, Lord. We love you so much. Help us to live our lives the way that you want us to, 
as we follow you, help us to grow and become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you back here next Sunday for part two of Among Us.